Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at the Moto G5S Plus. This is a lower cost smartphone from Motorola. It starts at around $279, and it comes with three gigs of RAM for that price, so not a bad starting point there. We're gonna be taking a closer look at this phone here in just a second, but I do wanna mention in the interest of full disclosure that this phone is on loan from Motorola. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own, and no one is reviewing what you're about to see before I upload it. So let's take a look now at the hardware. You've got a five and a half inch screen on this one, 1080p resolution, uh, nice and sharp. It's a 401 PPI display so if you were comparing this for example to an Apple phone they would call this a retina display it looks very very nice for a low-cost phone uh, good viewing angles on it as you can see nice and bright as well I'm very pleased with the display inside it has a Snapdragon 625 that's a 2 gigahertz chip and an Adreno 506 GPU it's running with Android 7.11 Nougat uh, weight on this one is 168 grams or 5.93 ounces and here in the United States it's compatible with all of the major carriers so Sprint Verizon T-Mobile and AT&T uh, whatever carrier you got uh, you can buy the phone unlocked you pop your SIM card in here and you are off and running. Now what's interesting about Motorola's phones is that different uh, regions get different features and here in the U.S. Uh, this phone does not have an NFC chip so you can't do uh, contactless Android Pay payments with it uh, but it does have a compass built in which the international models don't have so there's some trade-offs probably because of uh, FCC regulations here in the U.S. that might uh, limit some of that functionality there, so just uh, keep that in mind. Now, as I mentioned, the phone starts at $279. That's with 3 gigabytes of RAM and 32 gigabytes of storage. Uh, this one that they let me borrow has 4 gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage, and uh, this one costs $349, but the performance will be the same on some of the benchmarks you're about to see, so there's no real performance difference other than the fact that the 4 gig version might multitask slightly better but uh, if you are on a budget 279 will get you uh, the same performance I am very pleased with the build quality on this one it's all metal it feels really nice you can't take the battery out so uh, you will have to keep charging it but it does support turbo charging uh, they put Gorilla Glass 3 on the front here it feels like a nice uh, sturdy glass display on here and uh, feels really well put together here for a, a relatively budget phone uh, they do have a fingerprint sensor down here at the bottom that works as you would expect it to work so you just put your fingerprint on there and usually it unlocks the phone for you and just like their flagship phone that we looked at a couple of weeks ago the Z2 Force they have added some gesture controls to the uh, fingerprint reader here so you don't have to have the little navigation bar at the bottom of the screen it's an optional thing but uh, if I wanted to, for example, go back here, I can just slide to the left and it will uh, go back in uh, the Chrome browser. If I slide to the right here, I will get my uh, list of applications currently running, the multitasking list. And if I just tap on this, it will take me back home like a home button might work on other phones. And if you hold it down, uh, you get the Google Assistant also. So you do have some uh, things that you can do here with the uh, fingerprint sensor to navigate the interface. But largely, it is a stock Android interface and it seems to be working quite nicely. Now this is a quirky little feature, but we did like the haptic feedback engine on this one quite a bit. Uh, that's the little vibration motor that you feel when you're getting a phone call or when you're uh, typing on the screen here. And it does, of course, vibrate the phone like any other Android phone does, but it's a very understated vibration, so you don't feel the whole phone rattling every time you're typing on it. We really like that uh, little motor in there. We're seeing some improvements in maybe the resolution of these uh, vibration motors on some of the higher-end phones, and this one seems to have it as well. If you play with the Nintendo Switch, it kind of feels like uh, that does. Battery life on it is very good. We got through a whole day doing a smartphone kind of thing, making a few phone calls, browsing the web, watching a video or two, nothing too strenuous. You can certainly get through the course of a workday and have a good amount of battery left over at the end of it. Uh, everyone's mileage though on these smartphones varies because if you're far away from your tower, the phone's going to work harder to connect to it. So uh, generally, I think I can safely say you'll get uh, a good all day battery life out of this provided you're not uh, gaming on it 24 seven. And of course it does support the Motorola turbo charger. So it will charge up pretty quickly. Let's take a look at some of the ports on the phone. There are not many. At the bottom here, you've got a micro USB connector. I know a lot of people are looking for USB type C, but we're not there yet on uh, this class of phones. So you've got just a micro USB connector. Uh, the speaker down here is probably the phone's weak point. It's not very loud. It doesn't sound very good. So uh, that was the one area that 
that uh, I was dinging it was just on the quality of the speakerphone thing. But of course, if you plug in headphones to the headphone jack here, you can uh, alleviate that issue. So it does have a full headphone jack. On this side, you just have your volume rocker and the uh, standby switch. And on the other side here, you have the SIM tray for taking a nano SIM along with a micro SD card. So you can uh, further expand out the storage if you want by uh, popping this out and uh, getting that uh, SIM card installed along with a SD card if you want some more storage on the phone. Now on the back of the phone here, you've got a dual camera system. Uh, one of these cameras shoots in color, the other one shoots in black and white, and it uses the two images to try to do some depth in its portrait mode. I'll show you how that works here in a second. Uh, so by and large, the camera looks okay. It's not going to uh, be as good as the cameras on more expensive phones. You can see some of the photos we took with it a little earlier. Shoots at 13 megapixels. Not bad for the price point. Uh, not spectacular either. Uh, you do have some video options on here too, so you can shoot at uh, 4K at 30 frames per second. It looks okay, but there's no stabilization built in at that resolution. Uh, you do get a stabilizer though if you turn the camera down to 1080p at 30 frames per second, and you can see the difference here walking uh, with the camera with that stabilizer enabled versus not. It'll also shoot video at 1080p at 60 frames per second, but the stabilizer doesn't work at the 60 frames per second speed. So if you want a stable shot, uh, 30 frames per second at 1080p is the way to go. And it's actually a pretty passable uh, stabilizer. It is a software-based stabilizer. Uh, the other thing that this can do is uh, shoot with that portrait mode, and you can make some portrait adjustments uh, in post-production, essentially, after you've taken the photo. So let's take a look now and see how that works. All right, so I have the camera open right now. We've got this little game controller we're going to take a picture of. And right now, I'm in the basic camera mode. So if I just took a picture now, it would just give you what you see here on screen for the most part. But if I go down here, I've got some additional photo modes that I can enable. And uh, we're going to look at professional mode in a minute. But what I can do here is go over to depth enabled. And what this is going to do is uh, make the background blurry based on what the cameras are seeing. This is largely a software process where it's looking at what both lenses are seeing and then trying to guess at uh, what's in the foreground versus the background. And I can even adjust the level of depth here with this little slider at the bottom. So I can make it more blurry or less. And all of this I can change in uh, the editor that you'll see here in a second. So if I go ahead here and take a picture, uh, we're going to get a shot of that game controller. I'll scroll over here to show you what it looks like. So you can see there initially it didn't have the depth enabled and then it uh, processed the image in real time here for us. And you can see that it really nicely blurred out the background here. It does really well with these kinds of examples where you've got a real uh, definable background. I found it's a little trickier out in the field, which we'll uh, show you some examples of in a second here. But if I go over to this little icon, I can go over to the depth editor and this will allow me to do some non-destructive edits of this photo. So I could adjust, uh, for example, the selective focus on it so I can maybe focus on the background versus the foreground here. So it does a pretty nice job with that. And I can also adjust the level of blur that uh, it's going to apply to that as well. I'm just going to discard these changes real quick. They have some selective black and white stuff now too. So I could uh, maybe keep the remote control here in color and make the rest of it black and white. Uh, this works okay also. Again, every uh, picture you take is going to be a little better or worse depending on the conditions. You even got a cool feature here where you can uh, knock out something from the foreground here and then uh, put in something else in the background. So if we are uh, in the fall season here, I can move this around and uh, knock the thing out of the background. You can see it didn't do so well with the foreground here, but it did okay actually getting the uh, controller knocked out of its background. Not perfect, it will never be perfect, but uh, kind of a fun little thing if you want to just do a quick fun photo or something. This is certainly not going to be a uh, professional kind of feature. So kind of cool that you can do all these things. And I did want to show you one more real world example of the portrait mode here on this device. So this is a selfie that I shot on my back deck with the rear camera. It did make me look a little muscular than I really am in person, so it might be a good thing or a bad thing depending on the look you're looking for here. But uh, you can see what the uh, portrait mode did to this photo. So it didn't do too bad here, uh, but when you start going into some of the other modes like trying to knock out the background, you can still see they still have some work to do uh, in a few areas here. So there's no way to really adjust the uh, cutout here. So you can see that it's getting uh, a portion of the house here behind my head and it knocked out 
uh, half of my hair here, so it looks kind of funky here, but you could probably have some fun with this if you are uh, uploading something to Facebook or Instagram or something. So it does okay with the blurred out background, uh, not so great with their other features yet, but uh, in fairness, they are labeling these things as beta features at the moment, as you can see here. So uh, perhaps they can improve on it as it goes, but again, not bad for a $279 phone. And we also like the professional mode option on the uh, camera app here. So you can adjust things like the shutter speed here in real time and see what the impact of those decisions are on your overall exposure. Uh, you can also adjust the ISO here, the white balance, and uh, the exposure levels here too. So you do have a good amount of options for uh, just playing around with it. And I really do like these manual controls on smartphones because it's a great way to learn about exposure on your pictures, which you can then translate over to your larger cameras. Uh, the one thing though that you can't adjust on here is the aperture. Uh, the aperture on the rear lens is fixed at 2.0. Uh, the front camera here is nothing crazy. It's just an eight megapixel camera. Uh, it works and uh, it's as good as you'll see on most other smartphones, nothing spectacular, but uh, decent enough for taking a selfie every once in a while. Let's take a look now and see how the phone performs doing some real world tasks here. We've got my YouTube channel up and running and uh, we are running on Wi-Fi, of course, but it is uh, loading up very quickly here and seems to be uh, pretty snappy as we navigate around. So things have been pretty good on uh, that front. I've been very pleased with the performance of the phone overall, especially when you're jumping around from uh, one app to the other. So that's been a, a good experience for me here. I will take a look at NASA's website. I've got a couple of things already pulled up here, but I can maybe select this photo of Saturn and see how fast things uh, spring up here. And it looks like it's doing pretty nicely there too. Uh, the phone of course supports LTE when you're on the cellular network. Uh, right now we're on Wi-Fi. It does support a uh, Wi-Fi A, B, G, and N. Uh, so it does support five gigahertz networks, but I don't believe it supports wireless AC. But as you can see here, it seems to be doing uh, just fine on my five gigahertz network. And it does seem to be a pretty snappy little processor in here, especially for doing smartphone kind of stuff. But what about gaming? Let's take a look at a couple of games and see how it performs with those. So let's start off here with Minecraft. And it seems to be working quite nicely on the phone here. Pretty fast response. Uh, the display is very nice too with that 1080p resolution. So you'll get uh, really sharp images here and it looks like a pretty decent frame rate for uh, Minecraft here. So that's a good thing. Uh, let's switch over to uh, the other game that I've got loaded up here, GTA Vice City. And you'll see how it just quickly snapped over to the game. It didn't really have to load. And that's because I had it running here in the background. And again, we've got that four gigabytes of RAM, which makes it easy to uh, very quickly switch back and forth between games. And you can see here, this game seems to be uh, running pretty nicely too. So for basic Android smartphone games, this is probably going to be uh, just fine. And uh, one of the issues that we ran into with it was that we couldn't run our higher end 3D Mark benchmark, which supports uh, G OpenGL ES 3.0 or 3.1, I believe. It was not compatible with this phone. So we couldn't run some of our higher end benchmarks, but we did run uh, the lower end benchmark, which is called Ice Storm. And on that test, we got a score of 13,810. And that puts it in the ballpark of uh, other phones in its class, like the Honor 8, which you can see uh, there. The Honor 8 does a little better on the graphics, but uh, the same on the CPU. Uh, the iPhone 5S, which of course is a couple of years old now, uh, does perform a little better graphically than this phone does, but we still see a uh, better CPU performance out of it. So uh, for a mid-range phone, it actually does pretty nicely compared to some of the other phones I've looked at recently. And uh, performance-wise, especially for Android games like what you just saw and uh, for web browsing and other tasks, I think it will uh, do quite well there. So all in, I think it's a pretty decent value here. It's a name brand phone that uh, is at a pretty affordable price. I like the fact that it works on uh, any U.S. carrier here in the United States, which is not something you see too often on these lower end phones. Usually they only work with like AT&T or T-Mobile. Uh, here's a phone that works with everything and Motorola has been doing that uh, for quite some time now with their unlocked phones. So not a bad little phone to get for a kid. It's a little nicer than the El Cheapo phones that are out there. And I think you might uh, really like what you see here if you are not looking forward to spending $1,000 on a smartphone. You can spend two seven and get a very basic uh, but very functional phone here that has a lot of features that flagship phones had only a couple of years ago. So good stuff here, something I can recommend for the price point. If you want a better camera, you definitely need to spend a little more for that, but uh, everything on this has been uh, passable or more than passable. And the only thing I would change is the quality of the uh, speaker here at the bottom. So that's gonna do it for the G5S Plus, and this is Lon Seiben. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, John Prawl, William Miller, and Kalyan Kumar.
If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.